Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Marvel's What If Season 2, Episode 8, What If the Avengers Assembled in 1602? Loosely based on the 2003 Marvel 1602 eight-issue comic series written by Neil Gaiman, this episode transports our Avengers to Elizabethan England, and I'm going to break down all the Easter eggs, animation details, and other stuff that you might have missed, including the unspoken but really cool reason why 1602 London was the cosmic destination for these heroes, and this theater nerd was thrilled to realize it. Now, I am still technically on paternity leave. I'm sorry, kid. Jessica Clements has been so wonderful breaking down the first six episodes of the season, but she is feeling under the weather. So I'm pitching back in. Huge thanks to her and to John Costa and to Noah Chen for their help with these breakdowns. These have been a team effort and I'm so grateful to everyone at New Rockstars. This episode opens in London's Globe Theater, 1602, with Loki reciting Shakespeare's Hamlet. Act three, scene one, the famous quote, to be or not to be, that is a question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. So this soliloquy is coming from Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, pondering ending his own life as he deals with the anguish of his father's death by the hands of his treacherous uncle, Claudius, who sees the throne in the aftermath and the hand of his mother, Gertrude. But the fact that it's Loki performing this role is no coincidence. As the spurned adopted brother, he was long denied the throne and he had a complex relationship with his mother, Frigga. Loki later this episode cites Iago, the envious schemer of Shakespeare's Othello, which truly is the more apt role for the god of mischief. But we know from Thor Ragnarok that Loki is a lover of historical theatrical reenactments on the stage, which Shakespeare's histories were. And remember, when Tony Stark first met Thor in Avengers 2012, he mocked Thor and Thor's brother Loki's forest dispute as Shakespeare in the park. Doth mother know you wear as her drapes. But there is a deeper reason why the MCU Loki, especially recently, would love to be here right now. This quote from Hamlet underscores the broader dance macabre with existence all these Marvel heroes are going through, including the Watcher. This kind of describes their wrestling with reality in this episode, as this universe is doomed to die on its current trajectory. That's why it's fitting to open this episode with the image of the skull of Yorick. But a little nitpick here, Hamlet does not hold the skull of Yorick during this scene. That actually comes later in the play, Act 5, scene one. Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest. Yorick was Hamlet's old jester, who died many years past. And in subsequent art, the skull of Yorick has come to symbolize the concept of memento mori. Remember, you shall die. The idea that we are all mortal, even the silly ones who never took themselves too seriously, like Yorick. And notice how on the stage with Loki is a dead tree, which is interesting given his variant's fate as the god of stories in the Idrisil Tree of Time, a tree that looks healthier than ever. From the Queen's box, Thor heckles, while Queen Hela laughs along, sitting upon the throne, flanked by advisors, Sir Hogan and Sir Nick Fury. All of this is really an alteration from the Marvel 1602 comics. The what if sliding doors hypothetical of this episode is actually a mystery revealed only in the final minutes. And it is what if Steve Rogers during Infinity War ruptured the time stone and caused the modern Avengers to respawn in Elizabethan London. Steve Rogers is the forerunner character in the 1602 comics, but it's really due to different events. In the future, the Purple Man, Kilgrave, becomes a dictator or president for life, and Steve Rogers is sent back in time to erase the Purple Man's legacy, but he gets captured by Native Americans who mistake his name as Rojaz, and he serves as a bodyguard of the young Virginia Dare, who is the first child born in the Roanoke colony and is brought back to England. This all results in the multiversal rifts that threaten this universe, which is later contained within a gem and renamed by the Watcher as Earth-311. In the comics, Hela isn't the monarch, the historical Tudor monarchs are Elizabeth and James, and it's not a Captain Carter story but they repurposed it here for the What If series, in which Captain Peggy Carter is really the focal character. So here, the Green Rift opens, and Loki, trying to finish the soliloquy, shouts these important words. The dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, no trouble returns! Yeah, this comes from a little bit later in the Hamlet passage. But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. By undiscovered country, Hamlet is referring to an unknown afterlife, either heaven or hell. And it's really the perfect part of the passage to shout as Loki's being sucked into a possible hell mouth in the sky. So Peggy's able to save Loki, but she loses the queen, Hela. And so everyone bends the knee to the new King Thor Odinson, who now carries carries Hela's emerald encrusted scepter. It is similar to the scepter that Loki carried in the first Avengers film, which contained an infinity stone, the mind stone, but the green gem here is actually implied to be a piece of the time stone by the end of the episode. And it could be why this rift sucked in Hela and Loki in particular, as it's just
uses the Time Stone and Temporal Radiation, trying to heal itself and patch itself. But King Thor blames Captain Carter, and she steals the irradiated Yorick skull. Poor Yorick! A subtle nod to that Act 5, Scene 1 line, alas, poor Yorick. The Watcher explains that Captain Carter was brought into this dying 1602 universe by the Scarlet Witch, Wanda Maximoff, who in this episode is called Merlin Wanda, after Merlin the Wizard of King Arthur. And of course, this explains why Peggy fell through that crimson portal at the end of Episode 5. You'll notice Peggy now wears metal pauldrons and other armor pieces. Every character in this episode is wearing interesting armor versions of the suits that we've seen them wear in the MCU. But with Peggy, it's just interesting that this hero emblazoned with the Union Jack would come here. The Union Jack wouldn't become the official flag of the UK until 1801, but the imagery of the flag does go as far back to 1606 when James I, who was formerly James VI of Scotland, inherited the English throne and, you could say, ruled over England and Scotland and Ireland in a personal union, even if all three were still considered separate states. I just like the idea that Captain Carter might have inspired that design in this timeline, but again, there doesn't seem to be any Tudor dynasty in this reality. This reality was formed by Cap striking the Time Stone and spawning this new timeline where 21st century heroes were just sent to this particular point in history and then just begin to occupy various roles in the social hierarchy, kind of like a House of M reality, as opposed to a sliding doors timeline that fit in with the English society and the political structure as it was. So the Watcher now says Peggy is a fugitive from King Thor. On the run with no way home. Yeah, naturally he would use the title of an MCU multiversal crossover movie to describe Peggy's predicament, but the Watcher is surprised that Peggy can hear his narration. This elevates Peggy to the status of Strange Supreme and Ultron Infinity, and as of I Am Groot Season 2, Groot, all beings that could hear the Watcher, and you might say Nexus level beings. The Watcher says, Worlds die every day. I've watched millions fade from existence. I find it interesting that he said millions and not billions or even trillions, as folks like King the Conqueror have burned that many people out of time through their actions. But back in the year 1600, the world population was only 554 million. And I like how the Watcher literally fades out of this scene right as Peggy says she won't let this universe fade from existence. Thank you to Geology for partnering with us to bring you this video and also for giving our audiences exclusive access to their new Try Before You Buy program. You've probably heard me mention Geology before, the 28-time award-winning skin, hair, and body care company recognized in Men's Health, Hypebeast, Birdie, Esquire, Ask Men, and Oprah Daily Grooming Awards. But hey, I get it. It can be tough to change a skincare routine or start a new one. Part of what's nice about Geology is they create simple and effective skincare and hair care routines customized just for you. And now, if you want to try that new routine out before you buy a bunch of stuff, you can. Geology is offering New Rockstars viewers a free trial of their eight-piece skincare set with their Try Before You Buy program. You can experience it's a new skincare routine risk-free for 14 days. If you don't love it, send it back. It's that easy. The set is valued at $139. All you pay today is the price of shipping. And if you order today, get a free vitamin C plus E ferulic acid as a gift. You don't need to return it. That's yours. Just head to geology.com slash new rockstars and get your free trial. And geology will send you a personalized skincare routine. And if you don't mind me, I'm going to take some geology and uh, uh, look good for the rest of this video. King Thor's small council reports losses to these rifts and all these locations are named after random MCU figures like Nebula's Observatory, the Isle of Ego, Groot's Groves, known for its wines. I suppose Nebula would be looking out for Thanos and other cosmic threats, and I like how Ego is just an island instead of an entire planet. Happy growls at Wanda predicting the Forerunner would be coming from the future, and we see his skin just begin to turn a shade of purple. It also turns a shade later during the raid on the treehouse, and all of this is foreshadowing his inner form of the Freak, like we saw in episode 3 of the season. And I'm enjoying how the What If writers have decided that this this is just a core part of Happy Hogan now. In Stark's workshop, you can see that he is building a suit of armor with wings and a chest-mounted disc, making this a 1602 Iron Man suit because they wouldn't have jet propulsion technology yet. The only way this thing could fly is if it had wings, kind of like a Buzz Lightyear type of suit. And to the left of that is actually a shield with a star, reminding us of how his Malibu basement workshop had a version of Captain America's shield that he was working on. Hanging from above is a helmet with a T-visor that looks like a Mandalorian helmet, which I think might just be a John Favreau shout out. And to the right of Peggy in the reverse shot is a helmet that looks like Tony's original Mark I helmet repurposed for Obadiah Stane's Iron Monger suit, but this version of Tony is still working on his Mark I Elizabethan armor. And when Tony faints, you can actually see a hammer that looks like Mjolnir, though this might just be a blacksmith hammer that he's using to forge all this stuff. But later, Thor asks Loki where the hammer is, and Loki says he misplaced it. So this might actually be Mjolnir here. They examine the irradiated parts of Yorick's skull, and fun fact, the microscope was actually invented in 1590. I don't think it looked 
exactly like this, but you know, a brain like Tony Stark's would be able to build on the existing technology of the time. Peggy keeps dropping future technology terms around Tony and he loves it. And just to please him, she just says flux capacitor, which tells us that among her list of modern pop culture that she's been consuming, that she talked about with Natasha in episode five was the film Back to the Future, a film series that was cited in Avengers Endgame whenever these characters try to explain how time travel works in the MCU. Loki tells these women that Will has written a new play and he mentions Iago, of course, the villainous tragic hero in Othello. Othello was published in the year 1603, so this being 1602 would make this the new play that William Shakespeare was currently working on at this time. But Loki's carriage is raided by Steve Rogers, aka Rogers Hood, with his merry men, including Scott Lang and Bucky Barnes. These two did join Team Cap in Civil War. Now, the historical figure of Robin Hood, who was actually a real guy, actually lived in England back in the 12th century. And we learned that 1602 Peggy Carter died in this universe, setting up the heart of this episode as a love between Steve and Peggy. He asks her about her universe to Steve Rogers. Tell me what he's like. No, I, I don't think I will. Oh, she says the same line that old Steve Rogers says to Sam Wilson in Endgame when Sam asks what his other life was like. But in this case, it's really just because Peggy's too heartbroken that Skinny Steve became the Hydra Stomper assassin. Hogan crashes their secret treehouse with an army of royal yellow jackets. Now, I'm not sure if they're all Darren Cross or if they're soldiers who have replicated this technology. Hogan fires them out of an old timey pistol. It's kind of like how Hawkeye attached Scott Lang to his arrow in Civil War. Scott Lang says, oh, great, it's that freak Hogan, reminding us that Hogan has that inner freak that's been trying to break out. During the brawl, I love how Peggy and Steve share Peggy's Union Jack shield in these kind of shared attacks, like Steve kind of instinctively knows when and how to dodge a shield when it boomerangs back at him. Hogan uses the Destroyer armor from the first Thor film. That's the weapon from Odin's vault that Loki unleashed on Thor in New Mexico. Outside the Tower of London, the Executioner sharpening his ax, and we see that it is Red Skull. So facing defeat, Peggy asks the Watcher for help, but he poses this run of questions. What if the world doesn't magically correct it? itself? What if it's the final straw that destroys this universe? What if when the universe resets, you're trapped here forever? What if you die? What if, what if, what if? Yes, yeah, she just repeats the title of the series. And yeah, it really seems like Captain Carter is just becoming more and more of a meta Nexus character alongside the Watcher and Strange Supreme. Peggy locates in another cell, the monster in the Iron Mask. And for a second, I was like, oh, is this Victor Von Doom? But no, it is Bruce Banner with the Iron Mask presumably designed to contain the Hulk. And I like the idea that Stark may have designed this mask, similar to Tony in different realities, helping Bruce devise a Hulk anti-serum to better control that Hulk form. Peggy and Bruce return to Stark's workshop where you can see more sketches on the wall for his Elizabethan armor and the wings and the circular centerpiece, which definitely seems like an old school arc reactor whenever he would get around to inventing it. And he might have, but it seems like Stark spent the night after drinking some grain alcohol. Uh, another hint that, yeah, this Stark is going through his own demon in a bottle storyline here. This device that will reveal the Forerunner once the royal stone from the scepter is inserted and send him back. And right when he says this, in this moment, 1602 Steve walks in, foreshadowing that it is a Steve Rogers who is the Forerunner. So this team infiltrates King Thor's court and disguise and the rift opens Wanda tries to contain it the melee begins Scott tells Bucky that they'll teach everyone the dance macabre the dance macabre refers to an allegorical artistic genre from the late middle ages that would often depict the dead dancing to the grave which is really another icon of that term I brought up before memento mori much like Yorick's skull while Hulk smashes these guards he grunts dash your puny gods recalling when he called Loki a puny god in the 2012 Avengers meanwhile Steve slices a feather in Hogan's cap which is the final straw that causes him to finally Hulk out into the freak King Thor requests the Allfather, which is the name he gave his sword, which Peggy recognizes as vibranium. And Thor says the king of Wakanda gave it as a coronation gift, which reminds us how in episode two, we learned that the vibranium of the original Captain America's shield was given to Howard Stark as a gift by T'Chaka's father in the 1940s. And this reminds us that all the way back to the year 1602, Wakanda was there and Wakanda had vibranium and was keeping an eye on world events. Now throughout this fight, Hogan drops a string of old timey insults and terms at both Steve and Bruce. And Bruce just grabs him by the head and throws him into the church organ and when he throws the organ back at him, he says, the pipes, the pipes are calling, alluding to the verses of the old Irish song, O Danny Boy. Sir Fury gets the scepter from Thor and Stark extracts the green gem to activate this device, which Peggy does by plunging her hands into the box, functioning the same exact way as the Mark V suitcase suit from Iron Man 2. And the blast from her gauntlet 
freezes the Marvel heroes in time, and the Forerunner finally appears, and it is Steve Rogers. He takes us back to his duel with Thanos in the Battle of Wakanda and Infinity War when Steve had the Black Vibranium gauntlets given to him by T'Challa, and here he strikes the Time Stone. But what's odd here is that when Cap first confronted Thanos in Infinity War, remember, Thanos had not yet acquired the Mind Stone from Vision's forehead. That would come moments after Thanos repelled Steve, but the Mind Stone is in the gauntlet here. So in this alternate universe version of the battle, Steve would get back up and duel Thanos again. Remember, the guy can do this all day and would get in one last round with the Mad Titan and that it would be Steve Rogers, not Thor, who got in that final one-on-one -on -one with the guy. So really what they're saying here is that Steve's green color here, plus the green rifts in the sky, the green gem and the scepter, the fact that they've all frozen, all these are really just meant to convey that this entire 1602 universe is a cosmic aberration caused by the damage to the Time Stone. You could even say all this is contained within that chunk of the Time Stone. That's why the circumstances of this episode are so unlike every other instance of time travel or timeline manipulation we've seen in the MCU. They are really just an accident caused by cosmic radiation veering off in some other way. That Time Stone radiation caused certain Marvel heroes from 2018 to go back to the year 1602 and fit into these different corners of the English social hierarchy. But why that time and place in particular? Well, when you subtract 1602 from 2018, you get 616. I'm just kidding, it's just 416 years. I'm sorry to do that to you. But here's what I think the reason is. I believe it's because this is the era of William Shakespeare, arguably the most productive period of dramatic storytelling, at least in the English language, because the works of William Shakespeare were perhaps the most influential contribution to the way our society, to this day, understands narrative and sees our lives through dramatic lenses. Now, you may not agree with that, and you might believe that there are plenty of other artistic periods throughout world history that were more important, but I am just looking at this through the eyes of one MCU character who is more important than any other character right now, Loki. That is the character with whom we started this episode. He is the MCU's reigning god of stories who is currently throned at the heart of Idrisil, an image that we know we will see in tomorrow's finale. I believe it was Loki's control over time that displaced Marvel heroes back to these years in particular, to the era of Shakespeare. That could be why Loki even joined them here, despite remember Loki being dead after Thanos snapped his neck to get that space stone and the events leading up to Steve striking that time stone. There must have been some other Loki at work there and I think it was that one, the god of stories in Idrisil. Now Peggy tells Steve that they never got their happy ending and Steve says I'm sure somewhere out there we do and the final shot of Endgame proves that some other version of them will finally get that dance. And I'll admit my interpretation that this whole episode is about the history of storytelling might just be how I'm looking at things as someone clearly obsessed with the Loki finale. But it is worth noting that the final seconds of this episode shows Strange Supreme finding this stranded Captain Carter in 1602 and telling her this. Oh, Peg, have I got a story to tell you. A story to tell you. And we end with to be continued, as tomorrow's finale will be What If Strange Supreme Intervened. So our dear friend Jessica Clements is still feeling a bit unwell, so I may be hosting tomorrow's finale breakdown, but please, please, please go back to watch her incredible breakdowns of the first six episodes of the season and keep an eye out for our upcoming What If inspired series looking at real world hypotheticals, starting with What If Edgar Wright directed Ant-Man. I think you're gonna love that video. Subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. You can follow me at EA Boss support us with some exclusive merch from nerdriot.shop. It's the best way to support us. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.